Yeah, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here as always, and I'd like to thank the organizers, Andre, uh, Dimitri, and others for, for allowing me to uh, speak at this meeting. Um, the topic I think suits well for a conference on quantum materials with and without, or with or without quasi-particles, because the de Haas-Van Alphen effect is extremely central for such questions. Uh, this work is uh, done primarily by Pavel Nosov, uh, who is a graduate fellow here. Thank you, KITP, for supporting him. And also uh, by Yiming Wu, who's a postdoc uh, at Stanford. Feel free to interrupt during my talk. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end. Thank you for giving me permission. <laughs> oh, everyone except you. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, so um, de Haas van Alphen. Everybody knows in this audience knows what it is. It's the oscillatory magnetization that uh, is, is measured in the presence of a magnetic field. So you have a Fermi surface, for instance, a three-dimensional Fermi surface, and in a magnetic field, you have Landau quantization. As you change the magnetic field, the Landau levels cross the Fermi energy as they get depopulated. That at zero temperature produces a non-analyticity in the thermodynamic potential, and therefore everything else will be not, uh, oscillatory as a consequence. And these oscillations get washed out by impurities or by finite temperature. I want to define what's called the de Haas van Alphen or DHVA limit. We're going to be interested in frequencies much less than the Fermi energy, temperatures much less than the Fermi energy, but the ratio of, omega, sorry, not frequency, omega C, the uh, magnetic field scale, the cyclotron energy. Um, <clears throat> but the ratio of omega C to temperature can be arbitrary. Now, because we're in this de Haas van Alphen limit, uh, the contribution to quantum oscillations comes primarily from these orbits shown in red of this Fermi surface, the so-called extremal orbits, which have uh, the feature that the Fermi velocity along the direction of the magnetic field uh, vanishes. Okay, so let me remind you how lifshitz kosovich which is primarily the way we understand oscillations, works. Say you have a free Fermi gas, and in a magnetic field in three dimensions, the magnetic field is along Z. The energy for, uh, as a function of Landau level index N and uh, momentum PZ is given by this expression. So if you sum over, to obtain the thermodynamic potential, if you sum over the Landau levels via the Poisson summation formula, and you do the integrals over momenta via the saddle point to pick up the contribution from the extremal orbits, you get the, uh, exp the following expression for the thermodynamic potential, at least the oscillatory part. There's the smooth part, which has physics of Landau diamagnetism and so on. But the oscillatory part has uh, 1 over B oscillations. And one of the things that I will be concentrating on in this talk is the amplitude of the oscillations. So for the free Fermi gas, the amplitude is this expression here, and that's the lifshitz kosovich uh, expression. <clears throat> And if you look at the way it behaves, the, uh, at low temperatures, the amplitude is attenuated quadratically in temperature. And at high temperatures, it's attenuated as t times exponential, uh, in the, uh, at uh, exponential of the temperature divided by omega c. Well, the question that naturally arises is this is the free Fermi gas result. What about interactions? So in a classic book by Schoenberg on the subject of magnetic oscillations, I pulled out this quote. It says, the lifshitz kosovich formula remains valid except in extreme conditions, but the parameters that enter the lifshitz kosovich theory can be modified quite appreciably. And so this talk will be about one such extreme condition. So I want to stress the lifshitz kosovich theory works. It works remarkably well. 99% of all interpretations is in terms of this, and it works perfectly well. But in certain exceptions, it doesn't work so well, and that's the subject of my talk. So in order so that everyone can understand or appreciate the take-home message, I, I bring it up at the very front of my talk. And what I'm going to be telling you about is our work on de Haas van Alphen oscillations of a 3D metal that's tuned to a quantum critical point. OK? There's different, the yeah. Is outside the metallic, outside the metallic Hamiltonian. It's something I'm putting in my hand. It yes, I'm going to two into it. Okay, okay and uh, look at the universal low energy physics. Based but it's on not symmetry. part of your Hamiltonian describing the metal. It's it's something well, you assume exists. 
Yes. Independent of the yes. system. Yes. I just want to make sure yes. that's what it is. Yes, yes. If you could solve it as some interacting Hamiltonian and intermediate no, no, coupling, no. you would maybe yeah. arrive at that. But yes, it's an assumption. But that's not what you did. No, you, you... no. So the nature of the quantum critical point that I'm going to assume here is that it has associated with it broken symmetry, and the order parameter is not conserved. It doesn't, the, the order parameter preserves lattice translations. So an example of this would be the Ising pneumatic quantum critical point. Um, and if it were continuous, we would uh, have a low energy description in terms of the modes, the quasi-particles near the Fermi surface, coupled to the gapless order parameter fields at the critical point. And the way to solve that theory, a very straightforward and uh, useful way of obtaining insight into this is to solve the amygdal Eliasberg theory. And if you do that at zero field, let's say we have a theory of a quantum critical point where we have an overdamped harmonic oscillator, Landau overdamped oscillator, which sets the dynamical scaling laws to z equals three, and that overdamped uh, oscillators coupled to the fermions will dress the fermions into a marginal Fermi liquid, the kind that we heard this morning, but we're in three dimensions. So this is the setup at zero field. We have a Z equals three boson and a marginal Fermi liquid. Now we'll ask what happens to the mag finite magnetic field. And the key uh, point I want to stress is that while uh, two things. First, the naive extrapolation of lifshitz kosovich to this problem will suffer with some rather severe catastrophes. And so that's the extreme circumstance that I wish to study. And I want to explain how this, viol this, this problem comes about. That's the first part. And the second part, we want to tell you what the right answer is. The amplitude uh, exhibits a different temperature behavior at low temperatures. So you can see in lifshitz kosovich it falls off as T squared at low temperatures. But now I'm going to tell you so a story which falls off as T to the 4 thirds. OK, so that's a, a big difference. And the whole point of my talk will be to convince you, or at least to advertise, how we uh, arrived at this result. OK, so the first part is how the lifshitz kosovich applied to this quantum critical point problem will break down. So suppose we have an interacting Hamiltonian. If I could obtain the full thermodynamic potential by obtaining this trace, there would be nothing to talk about. OK, but I can't do that. I can't solve the fully interacting problem non-perturbatively. But what we can do is express the thermodynamic potential in the form that was uh, first put down by Luttinger and Ward in terms of the fully dressed propagators and self-energies of the Fermi system. Okay, so that's the fully dressed propagators G and, and, and self-energy is sigma. And this additional term here, phi, is the so-called Luttinger-Ward functional. It involves an infinite set of diagrams known as the skeleton uh, expansion. Um, and if I could study this, this is also not very easy to study, we would be able to obtain the de Haas van Alphen effect. Now, Richard, because we're in a magnetic field, everything oscillates. The self-energy has a piece that's smooth, doesn't oscillate, and a piece that oscillates. And so around the same time that Luttinger and Ward did this, Luttinger came up with a, a, a scheme to understand the de Haas van Alphen effect in Fermi liquids, and it goes as follows. If you neglect the oscillatory part of the self-energy, because its, its contribution to C is suppressed by a factor of omega C over E Fermi to the power 1 half. So it's subleading in the DHVA limit. If you ignore it, it turns out it's very easy to show that there's a cancellation between this term and the Luttinger-Ward functional. And so what you're left with is a somewhat simpler expression. Once you analytically continue the frequencies to the real line, you get an expression for the amplitude that looks like this. Now, this might look a little complicated, but actually it has a very simple physical interpretation. First, let me tell you, if you, if you switch off all self-energy effects, the integrals can be done trivially, and you recover lifshitz kosovich okay? If you have some self-energy, say, coming from phonons or something like that, what happens is that you can interpret their, their effects as either dressing the cyclotron mass into some renormalized mass, as in this term, or via some lifetime effects that enters like kind of like a dingle temperature. And this works just fine for the electron phonon problem. That is the dingle temperature. Right? The definition it's dingle. temperature dependent though, because the inelastic processes the are contributing. Temperature dingle temperature is one over omega C tau. No, I'm just I'm this is a naive discussion at this point in time. So no, I'm not. Good. So if 
if we apply this expression to the fact that there are thermodynamic constraints, after all, we're talking about the thermodynamic potential, the entropy is this, this derivative and the heat capacity is the second derivative, shown here, and we know from the third law of thermodynamics that both must vanish as t goes to zero. So since the amplitude is, is the oscillatory part of the thermodynamic potential, it must also satisfy the feature that its derivative must vanish as t goes to zero, and t times its second derivative must vanish as t goes to zero. Andres? Free, very quick question. Yeah. When you wrote uh, free energy, Latin reward free energy. Yeah. This is fermionic. Part. Only fermionic, yes. What yes. about bosonic part? I, I'll get to that. So okay. right now we're ignoring the bosonic contribution, which turns out to be a fatal uh, assumption to do, but, but nonetheless good. I'm just going to go with it. Okay? Thank you for asking me that, and thank you for reminding me to say that. Okay, so, <clears throat> so let's, let's put these constraints and at the quantum critical point. So I'm going to apply that formula that I wrote down to the 3D metal at the quantum critical point with these assumptions. And when you do that, you solve these equations. These are the migdal eliasberg equations. The first two are just the Dyson equations, and the second two are uh, the expressions for the bosonic self-energy sigma and, uh, sorry, the fermionic self-energy sigma and the bosonic self-energy pi. As Andre said, I'm going to ignore pi because naively I think, well, bosons are neutral. They're not going to go around in circles in a magnetic field. So at this point, I'm being extremely naive. I'm going to ignore their contribution to the de Haas von Alphen effect. We'll come back to that later. But when I solve these equations, these self-consistent conditions, I get a following set of solutions at zero field. First, the bosonic self-energy causes the harmonic oscillators to become overdamped when z equals three dynamics. And the fermionic self-energy gets dressed into this marginal Fermi liquid form, as argued by, as first suggested by Varma. But this is actually a three-dimensional quantum critical point problem, very different in context. All right, so I'm ignoring the bosonic contribution. If we simply stick in blindly, and we're going to, the, the regular part of the, the real part of the self-energy is regular, let me ignore that, that might dress the quasi-particles into some mass, but ignore that for now. Let's look at the imaginary self-energy and in this expression for the extended lifshitz kosovich formula. What I want to do is obtain the entropy from this, okay, because if I can do that by taking the temperature derivative. The temperature arrive, uh, uh, occurs in two places. First, there's the Fermi function, and second, there's the temperature dependence of the imaginary part of the self-energy. If you differentiate with respect to the Fermi function, what it causes is this integral with respect to frequency will be sharply peaked about omega equals zero. It'll be cut off at something of the order of temperature. And as temperature goes to zero, that contribution to the entropy vanishes. There's a second term, which is, involves the derivative of this imaginary part of the self-energy. And if you take this, this form of the marginal Fermi liquid, you find that there's a catastrophe, namely that the amplitude, the, the temperature derivative of the amplitude diverges as t goes to zero logarithmically, okay? Now there's a very vivid, and so that's a violation of the third law. If you prefer to say, think about it in terms of pictures, here's the de Haas von Alphen amplitude, the dashed line is lifshitz kosovich If you do naive extent, uh, lifshitz kosovich is the kind of, I, I just talked about, which I call the extended lifshitz kosovich you obtain an amplitude that behaves like the solid curve. And, and as you can see, its temperature derivative is finite. And so that violates the third law. If you look more closely, there are, logarith that, that there are logarithmically uh, divergent contributions there. But for now, you can see at this crude level that this is not a physically sensible form of the amplitude. Is this corrected when you put more It's corrected, but we have to do more than that. It's corrected, that's the take home message. Okay. So what's the strategy? The strategy that we're going to employ is we're going to find an exact expression for the, the migdal eliasberg entropy in a magnetic field. And then we're going to evaluate it in the de Haas van Alphen limit, and then we're going to obtain the magnetization from the entropy just via thermodynamic relations, Maxwell relations. And what we'll find is this form here. And I'll explain this figure as we go along. Okay, so the thermodynamic potential in the migdal eliasberg approximation is a functional of exact Green's functions and self-energies. So I want you to think about the self-energies as something we vary rather than something we compute. 
And so the variational principle with respect to the thermodynamic. I'm slightly confused by your location. Uh, G already contains sigma. So wh why sigma is like put in separately? I mean, the, the full Green's function is nothing other than one of G0 minus G0 inverse minus sigma inverse, right? So why sigma? At the saddle point. At the, at the saddle point, that's the condition. Oh. So I want you to think of these as variational parameters that you vary with respect to, and the set, and this condition that the first variation vanish will give you the migdal Eliasberg expressions. Right, so, but so what for I'm instance, asking is G independent of sigma? G depends on sigma, right, uh, uh, functionally. Full Green's function depends on self energy, at, right? At the saddle, at, at oh, migdal Eliasberg equations. So I want you to think about it as something you are kind of, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So if you look at the thermodynamic potential of this form, so you, it involves bare Green's functions and self energies. If you uh, apply this variational condition, you will get the migdal Eliasberg equations. Now, the Luttinger Ward functional here, phi, in the migdal Eliasberg limit is simple, well, relatively speaking, compared to the non migdal version. It has only one contribution, one skeleton diagram. So one could imagine evaluating this. And now, because of the saddle point condition, Instead of evaluating the thermodynamic potential itself, what uh, we, we do is we obtain directly the entropy. So the entropy is the derivative with respect to temperature. So there's a, a derivative with respect to temperature that acts only on the distribution functions. That's what this prime means. And then there's the chain rule. And But because of this variational conditions, these contributions vanish. OK. So as a consequence, we have this complicated, somewhat complicated looking expression for the entropy. Um, but what I want you to take away from this, now we have contributions from the fermionic sector, we have contributions from the bosonic sector. And after certain, uh, certain some algebra, you can show that the entropy simplifies to this. This, by the way, was uh, first noted, or at least published in a paper by Gordon Bame in the context of relativistic plasmas. What we did was, uh, what Pavel and, and uh, Yaming did was to apply this to uh, the case of a finite non-relativistic system in a magnetic field at criticality. Okay, so although that previous expression looks somewhat complicated, what you need to see is that the temperature derivative only enters the Fermi distribution, and there's a bunch of other stuff which, because this, this piece here is going to be sharply peaked about at zero frequency, at the width of the order of the temperature, everything else that, that is in this somewhat messy looking expression can be evaluated at zero temperature. Okay? Is that true near quantum critical point? Yes. So, but there's non analytic self energy dependence at the quantum critical point. Okay? And that converts itself, when you stick that in to this schematic region, into non-analytic temperature dependence once you do this frequency integrals. And so at the end of the day, you get an expression for the entropy, the oscillatory part of the entropy of this mar marginal Fermi liquid at criticality, which is of the form T log T. Okay, there's one contribution here, but then there's two more. And I'll talk to you, talk you through those as we go, go, go along. This, the way you understand this is even at zero field, there's a T log T uh, contribution to the entropy of the marginal Fermi liquid, but now the, os the, the prefactor here is the oscillatory part of the density of states, which I'll define uh, in a moment. For now, it's just a parameter that depends on the magnetic field. But there's two other contributions to the entropy that are even more important. Okay? The first one is, uh, I'll, I'll explain, it has the physics of what's called dimensional reduction. Okay? And what that is, is remember when we're doing oscillations, when we do the you know, saddle point integrals, only extremal orbits contribute. But now we have the additional complication that we have a soft boson that's coupling to the Fermi surface. So when we have dimensional reduction shown in this extremal orbit here, we have to take into account the contributions from gapless overdamped bosons. And you might know, for, for those of you who are experts in the audience, of which there are many, if you study a similar problem, in two dimensions, there's an omega to the two-thirds self-energy, and that results in a t to the two-thirds contribution to the entropy, which is much bigger than the t log t uh, contribution that I alluded to a second ago. But then the last contribution, by the way, these three expressions is the thing that takes the longest to show, but the 
quickest to describe in a talk. The last contribution. The omega to the two-thirds comes from the bosonic degrees of freedom. The, the fermionic self-energy being omega to the two-thirds, but along right. the extremal orbit. Right, but these, the degree of freedom that's being dimensionally reduced are the bosons to well, get you're, to that result. And the fermions, right, because we have a spherical Fermi surface, mm -hmm. but we're looking at the extremal orbit, which is a two-dimensional orbit. And then it's coupling ga uh, to the gapless boson, but only the coupling near the extremal orbit matters. Tangentially to the orbit is much more important than away right. from the extremal yeah. orbit. Yes, that's right. So in that sense, you're correct. But this last contribution, which, which is a consequence of the dynamical scaling laws, the z equals three bosons, is even more singular. So it goes like t to the one third. Notice, by the way, that all of these entropies that we are computing vanish as uh, t goes to zero. Okay, so we're not violating any laws of physics but we do obtain new contributions to the entropy, the oscillating, oscillating entropy. So at low temperatures, this t to the one-thirds contribution will be the most important. And so if I, if I keep only this, and this new oscillation is, is given here, it's, it's proportional to square root of omega c over uh, uh, Fermi energy. If you then use Maxwell relations, you get that the magnetization is the constant part at zero temperature minus the piece that falls off as t to the four-thirds. Okay, so I want to stress that this, this could not have been obtained without uh, invoking Landau damping and the z equals three boson. So there's, as a control, if you wish, there's another theory, which uh, I worked on about a decade ago, which is if you take it literally, if you take the strict large n limit, it has a fatal problem that it doesn't have Landau damping. So what happens then is that the, the, the dynamical scaling laws are z equals one. And if you redo the steps to obtain the thermodynamic entropy, the oscillating part only has the t log t contributions. Okay? And you can ignore the bosonic contributions. So what does this tell you? So from this, you get a magnetization that behaves as t squared log t. Log t. This tells you that bosons, their contribution is extremely important. Dynamical scaling laws are extremely important. Okay, so at, at the end of the day, the z equals three marginal Fermi liquid quantum critical point, if you were to do the de Haas van Alphen oscillations, our theory suggests this form of the amplitude. And um, if you had a z equals one boson, the amplitude would behave qualitatively differently. Okay, so I'm done with my talk. We've shown that there's been a a way that pi of studying quantum oscillations pioneered by Luttinger and others, that, that's been the, the way things are done for almost for over 60 years. Um, they work well for 99% of the problems, but they break down at quantum criticality. We obtain new approaches to uh, these de Haas von Alphen oscillations, and from this we learned that uh, certain assumptions that were made by Luttinger, namely that you, have, you can ignore the oscillating part of the self-energies, those matter at the quantum critical point because of non-analytic dependence and frequency. Uh, the dynamical scaling laws matter, and we obtained the magnetization from a thermodynamically legal form of the entropy. Thank you. Uh, very nice talk. I just have a very simple question. So. Uh, are there any interesting uh, conclusions other than quantum oscillation, but also on the Landau diamagnetism for non-Fermi liquids? Uh, we didn't. We didn't look at that. So if you look at t much bigger than omega c, t much bigger than omega c. We looked at t much bigger than omega c. Uh, all of these effects that I describe get washed away. Right. There's uh, no oscillation, but there should be some. They're they're exponentially constant. Dead. Yeah. There's absolutely Landau diamagnetism. Uh, and also para poly paramagnetism. It's, but w w what the coefficients are, we didn't look at. Uh, Sri, probably completely irrelevant question. Uh, when you look at free energy, uh, fermionic plus bosonic plus skeleton diagram, yes. uh, at zero field, then one piece of information that I know is that there is a constellation, and as a result, the whole free energy can be written as only bosonic part. All yes. fermionic part it, as, as shown in your recent paper. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what happens to the finite field? Is there a similar constellation or there is no constellation at all? Th there's in some other words, can you express everything in terms of only bosonic part? 
with Landau dumping of course coming from Fermions, et cetera. I think, okay, so first of all, we didn't, we looked at the entropy, okay, because it turns out that's an easier object to contribute, calculate than the Fermi thermodynamic potential. But there is a contribution from G sigma and D pi. Whether you can write that all into one thing, I don't know. I think you can. Maybe, maybe, maybe Pavel knows. Yeah, okay. Shri, you talked about how the temperature dependence changes. How about the amplitude of the oscillations? That was the amplitude. No, no, I know, but interpreting, you know, the frequency of the oscillations, I'm sorry. Oh, the frequency of the oscillations has to satisfy flux quantization on Zager's principle that namely what enters is the area, not mass. The mass doesn't enter the frequency because the mass is sort of the derivative of the area with respect to energy. So it's just KF and it's all the same, so then. I want to come back to this question of you could just put the self-energy at zero temperature. I don't see how that's the case. The self-energy is a highly singular function of frequency, which is also then rounded out at the same temperature scale. Don't you have omega over T scaling or you don't? I mean, up to logs you do, I thought. So what we're doing is we're keeping the full self-energy, the oscillating parts and the non-oscillatory parts, but we're expanding in the oscillatory parts. We're essentially redoing what Lifshitz and Kosovich did with the self-energy. At some point where you compute the entropy by taking the temperature derivative. Yes, You said that only the Fermi function matters. Correct. That's what I'm asking about. Yeah, that's an exact statement. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced. That's okay. We, we should, I mean, that's the thing we should write on the board and so on. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from Chandra Varma. Okay. Um, Zoom, he's asking whether you are familiar with uh, a paper by Pilzer, Miyake, and Chandra Varma. I am, about yes. LK in 2D, where they showed that uh, Blishus Kosevich was uh, retained. Yes. Yes, that, I am familiar with that paper. Uh, that was in two dimensions. There's another paper by, I think, Di, uh, Dimitri, uh, saying, making similar statements, but of two-dimensional systems. We're studying a three-dimensional system. Uh, we did not retain uh, Lifshitz Kosevich. Pardon? There was a, a deviation from Lifshitz Kosevich in 2D. In 2D? Yeah. But it wasn't a, a, um, a, a quantum critical point, it was yes. just a yes. Fermi liquid, yes, but it was a, a mixture there. between disorder and yes. interactions, yes. which mimics um, marginal Fermi liquid uh, behavior. And yes. we only looked at the high temperature tail, which is exponential of T log T, yes. which you also get. Yes, yes. I have a question. So Please. this, or, or a comment, this omega C, when you talk about cyclotron resonance yes. frequency, it's probably not Do you really- you have any reactions in 2D? Pardon? So do you have any corrections in two dimension with a marginal Fermi liquid at the critical point? Uh, Ch Hi, Chandra. I haven't, we haven't looked at that. We looked at the 3D problem. Okay. So, so I can't answer off the, off the cuff. Wait, so this uh, cyclotron frequency is probably not real cyclotron frequency. It's, it's, it's that associated with that orbit. But it's, yeah. but uh, in particular with regards to things like Cohn's theorem, it's it's E B over M, where that M is some fully renormalized mass, presumably. Right. Same so, thing that you measure. Yeah. So right. You measure frequency of cyclotron resonance, and that would be the real cyclotron frequency, and that is mm -hmm. this one is protected by the Cohn theorem. Yeah. The cyclotron frequency which enters the amplitude of the it's not urban alpha is not protected, yeah. and it is renormalized. It could be different. Great question. That's why uh, we extract the renormalized mass from the amplitude, right? Otherwise, there would be no point. Uh. It's a related question. Experimentalists use uh, Lipschitz Kosevich to extract mass. Yeah. So your corrections, how much would it affect the extracted mass? That's a good question. So, okay, first of all, as I said about the extended Lipschitz Kosevich, if you're in a Fermi liquid, the, the renormalization due to some regular Fermi liquid part can be interpreted as a mass. But if you're at, at the quantum critical point, when you get the form of the oscillations that I alluded to, namely this, you shouldn't be thinking of that as mass. This is, this, it's, what it tells you is it's a bad coordinate system to work with. That's a Fermi liquid-like coordinate system to work in. At the quantum critical point, it's 
contribution comes from the bosons, the fermions. There's all kinds of incoherent stuff that's all connected together. You can't interpret it simply as one, one parameter. Okay, other, we have time for one other question. But if not, then okay, let's thank Sri. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker in the session will be Philip Phillips.